and we've come up with a, a design that puts 12,000 people in one building. Four months before he died in 2011, Steve Jobs made his final public appearance, pitching Apple's new campus, which opened this year. Central to his vision was turning existing parking lots into a green landscape. The overall feeling of the place is going to be a zillion times better than it is now with all the asphalt. So we'd like to plant a lot of trees, including some apricot orchards. But Jobs didn't mention that the new parking structure on campus would have more floor space than the office building. That's because it wasn't Apple's plan. The decision came from the city of Cupertino, which demanded 11,000 parking spots for the campus. But Cupertino is hardly unique. It's estimated that in America, there are eight parking spots for every car, covering up to 30% of our cities and collectively taking up about as much space as the state of West Virginia. The more parking we have, the more we're able to drive. So the rules that manage our parking not only influence the way we move around, but also shape our urban landscapes. If you look at pictures of the American cities around 1920 and 1930, all of the curbs are just completely filled with parked cars. And they couldn't use prices to manage demand because the parking meter wasn't even invented until 1935. This is Donald Shoup, an urban planning professor at University of California, Los Angeles, whose specialty is parking. As cars filled cities in the early 20th century, two inventions came to dominate parking management throughout the United States. The first was the parking meter. The meter manufacturers popularized the parking meters. They offered them free to cities, and they kept the revenue until the meter was paid for in about six months, and then the city got all the revenue. They offered to install them on one side of the street only, so people could see how it worked on one side and how it worked on the other. At the same time the parking meter was invented, cities invented the idea of off-street parking requirements. Off-street parking requirements, also known as mandatory parking minimums, are the second invention. And though you may not be aware of them, most of the parking lots you're used to exist because of these rules in the background. Look at any place from the air, any suburban place from the air, you'll see an awful lot of land taken up for parking. And most people don't know why. It's our policy that we require our cities to be built with a lot of parking. With suburbanization after World War II, off-street parking requirements became popular with city governments. They forced developers to include parking for their new buildings, which created a huge supply of parking at no cost to the city. Off-street parking requirements uh, really spread throughout the United States faster than almost any other urban planning invention. They arose partly because of the lack of management of on-street parking. If you can't manage the on-street parking properly, you need off-street parking requirements or everybody will say, how did you let this building be built when there's not enough parking? A typical requirement looks like this. For every 1,000 square feet of new building, there has to be a set number of parking spots, which varies by land use. You have to have a parking spaces per something. There could be a number of spaces per bassinet in a hospital, or per holes in a golf course, or per 1,000 gallons of water in a swimming pool. One of the oddest ones is for a funeral home, because that's sort of the you know, parking spaces per what? An average parking spot requires about 330 square feet, which includes car storage and empty space, allowing the car to move in and out and for doors to open. That means if a policy requires three spots per thousand square feet, the parking lot needs to be the size of the building. And many parking requirements need more spots. A restaurant may need 10 spots per thousand square feet, making the parking lot over three times larger than the restaurant. Planners don't have any training in how to set them. There's really no way to say how much parking every building needs. So there's a pseudoscience that has grown up. It's like like, uh, like bloodletting, you know, which was a major form of medical treatment for a couple thousand years. And they look just like parking requirements today. Building parking is expensive, especially when it involves a large construction project. We pay for the, the free parking that we demand in every role we have in life other than as a driver, as a taxpayer, as a resident, as a shopper. And just because you pay nothing at the parking lot at a grocery store doesn't mean the cost goes away. It's still there. It's just that the driver isn't paying for it. 
Developers who don't comply with parking requirements pay tens of thousands of dollars in fees for every spot that they don't include. A lot of times, these costs prohibit new development. This is the most valuable land on Earth. Land is expensive for, for housing, but it's free for parking. And you wonder why we have a problem? Parking requirements often result in more parking space than building space, pushing buildings further apart from each other, making it harder to walk, and encouraging more driving. Many of the dense cities that we love, like Paris or Washington DC or Amsterdam or New York, wouldn't look like this with parking requirements. These arbitrary rules continue to shape the growth of our cities and increase traffic congestion. But the excessive amount of land dedicated to parking is able to be repurposed. We have a terrific opportunity to convert underused parking lots into housing where people want to live. The upside is that we have a lot of benefits to, uh, to reap from changing our policies. Well, to boil an 800-page book down into three bullet points, uh, I have three basic recommendations. Remove off-street parking requirements, charge the right price for on-street parking, by which I mean the lowest price the city can charge, and still have one or two open spaces on every block. So nobody can say there's a shortage of parking. In order to, to reach that price, you have to vary it by location and, and time of day. But once you've done that, make it politically popular and spend the revenue on public services on the metered streets. Well, I'm worn out. <laughs>